Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Our first presentation is Keeping Your Course Relevant by Frank Mara. There. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, as a point of reference, uh, I am the lead instructor for the new public relations leadership area of emphasis, and I also teach applied public relations and crisis communication. Okay. I was talking to Matthew about preparing for the podcast earlier today, and he suggested a question. What's the benefit of Integrate? Fair question. Why are we here? For me, it's about engaging with uh, the people that we work with. Uh, we'll talk this afternoon about ways to engage our students, but for me the big benefit is to engage with the people we, uh, we work with that we don't see because we are isolated. Today, tomorrow, Saturday, uh, is a terrific opportunity to share ideas with each other. Uh, one caveat before I begin, when Cindy asked me to uh, talk about keeping classes relevant, uh, I think I laughed. For me, teaching crisis communication, it's not because I want to stay relevant, but it's because I have to keep the class relevant. God knows there's a new crisis every day. In fact, I check my cell phone and it's every hour there's a new crisis. Lots of people on uh, the next hour and a half will provide specific suggestions about how we can make our classes better. Uh, and more relevant by improving how we engage with our students. Uh, but let me offer a few comments that I hope will, will go, will, that will go beyond what they offer. And it comes from my background, uh, working with my students, and it's some insights that uh, perhaps will in increase the relevance and value of your classes to your students. Prove me wrong is a philosophy that my mentor, Jim Gruning, at the University of Maryland built into his graduate classes. I use it today in my classes with my students. It's easy for students to think there is only one right answer, and the professor is always right. The fun of graduate education is getting students to think and to use their experiences to challenge the current principles and practices. Prove me wrong helps create a safe culture in the class where students have the confidence to share their firsthand experiences and to challenge the textbook, to challenge accepted strategies, and best of all, to challenge me. Love it when that happens. The best discussions have lots of different and valid perspectives. Prove me wrong or prove your classmates wrong helps encourage students to develop confidence about their opinions. Are our assignments good or are they great? Do we have one or two memorable assignments in each class that resonates with our students? One student made an important comment in the recent evaluations. She said, I truly appreciate your feedback and guidance, in addition to the supplemental information that gives perspective to many of the lessons. The extra information, the supplemental information she really enjoyed. Extra information can go a long way towards providing relevance in a class to students. And you can do this fairly easily. Uh, a digital subscription to the New York Times costs $4 a month. The Washington Post, I think I'm paying $2 a month. So you can get this information fairly easily, fairly inexpensively. I try to regularly post two to three stories a week in the articles and links section of the discussion board that reinforces the relevance of the content for that week. Chad was talking about that. Let's have relevant information in our classes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Last fall, for example, in the crisis communication class, I posted several stories about the massacre in New Zealand and the leadership of Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. Relevance doesn't have to be long articles that can overwhelm students, and we don't want to provide too much information with the textbook and the readings and everything else, so we don't want to overwhelm. Sometimes keeping relevant can be uh, as short as a uh, screen grab of a tweet to make a point. At the start of the semester, for example, I talk about impossible crises that organizations can't plan for. 
Officials at Fort Bliss are reassessing flight patterns after a military helicopter dropped a box of ammunition through the roof of a nearby El Paso elementary school. You can't make this stuff up. Okay? And it's good to show, this is a good example to show students about what, you, what comes out of left field. And sometimes I'll use first-hand examples the students can relate to uh, to show the relevance of a particular strategy or a tactic. Uh, one of the concepts I talk about is running and hiding from a crisis. Uh, that rarely works. Uh, and so I share an example, first-hand example, that I think the students can relate to because most of them have pets as well. This is one of my cats and one of her visits to the vet. And she's trying and hoping and praying that the vet will not find her. <laughs> Didn't work. We often talk about abstract, con abstract concepts in our classes. It helps when we include reality checks. Here's an example that includes a simple but tough question. What would you do if you were faced with a crisis that can have a really good or a really bad outcome? <laughs> yes, that's a skunk. And this actually happened to me. This was a, a story that happened last year. A police officer came across a skunk that, was, that caught its head in a, a cup. And the police officer was thinking, as I thought about, oh, probably about 10 years ago, uh, my parents have a pool in their backyard, and it had the cover on it for the winter. And there was some water in it, and it was very slippery. And there was a, a gully, a ravine in the back of their house. And one night I'm having dinner with my parents, and all of a sudden we see a squirrel in the back of the pool. And I'll, get, I'll go out and I'll get the net, and I'll get the squirrel out. Right, because that's what you do. You want to save the squirrel. There's no need to have it drown or whatever. I go out, and the squirrel has a stripe down its back. And I say, oh, jeez. You know, what am I going to do? You have one really angry, anxious squirrel trying to get up, and it can't do it. And if I put it in the net, I'm going to get skunked. All right? So I take my chances, and I get the squirrel out, and I toss it over the net. And it goes down, and I swear to God, it turns around and comes right back in the pool again. And I said, God has a sense of humor. Okay, and I did it again. But in this case, you know, what would you do when you're faced with this? You're really not sure what to do. And in this case, the skunk actually looked at the police officer and moved on. One way that I've used for the past year to increase the relevance of my class is to replace a writing assignment with an exercise that earns professional certification for the students in the class. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, offers a variety of certifications. They take about two hours each to earn. They can do this online. The one certification I require all of the students to earn is Incident Command System. That's at the entry level, so they do that. And then they have the option to choose another certification. And FEMA has about oh, 35 or 40 to choose from, including managing volunteers during a crisis, uh, emergency management for higher education, emergency management for small businesses, religious and cultural diversity during a disaster, uh, the needs of children during a disaster, needs of animals during disaster, and people with disabilities in disasters. Each of these are cert certifications that the students can earn, and this is a replacement for a writing assignment, and again, ties back to relevance. And finally, although I'm pretty good at what I do, I don't have all the answers. And because the profession is changing so quickly, and again, this is something that Chad mentioned, there are often more questions than answers. So for several discussion questions and writing assignments, what I do is I add short audio clips of practitioners answering the, answering the questions. I go to the practitioner and say, how would you deal with this? And I edit it down, probably 90 seconds, two minutes, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more, and I have a variety of people who participate. And the practitioners, not surprisingly, they often jump at the chance to participate. They add their insights. And it's great for the students to see the relevance. And it's also great for the uh, students to get a different opinion just beyond mind. The variety is exciting. And I even get more excited when the practitioners disagree with me, when they come from a different perspective, which I think is terrific. And the best part, recording their comments is easy. You can do it over Skype. Something as simple as a lavalier microphone that you can plug into your iPhone. There are more complicated solutions, but it is fairly easy to get uh, the comments from the professionals. And it adds 
uh, real-world insight, real-world relevance uh, from a variety of different uh, chief communication officers that I think the students appreciate. Okay. At the end of the eight weeks, the students will have earned three credits. They'll remember a handful of concepts, maybe. Okay. Our lessons are good, our assignments are good, but can we go beyond the material in a variety of different ways to make our abstract, our hypothetical content more relevant? Great, thanks. Okay, just a second. This mouse is very touchy. <laughs> Why is it not? There you go. Let's close, close this one. But where's the mouse? Hmm? Yeah, I know. Hold on. I'm not sure what happened here. I'm not sure what happened there. It's okay. He's grabbing a mouse, so just a second. Let's move it over here. Okay. Right, awesome. Okay, sorry about that. Our next presenter is um, Lee Boggs, and he's going to talk about setting expectations. Okay, uh, my name's Lee, and I teach Audience Insight. I'm the lead instructor. I've been teaching Audience Insight since 2015. Uh, started teaching political marketing in 2011, up until that time. So I, I literally just arrived here before we had our picture made. I drove in from South Carolina, the Georgia side of South Carolina. So it's a pretty long drive, a lot of stop and go traffic. Those of you who teach data analytics, you'll probably appreciate that uh, my wife had put on my cell phone an app had put a cell phone, uh, put an app on my cell phone where she could track where I was, Life 360. So she's calling me during my trip, asking me where I am, why am I stopping, and so forth. Called me several times to tell me to slow down. <laughs> so I said, but you don't understand, I gotta go make this presentation. And she said, yeah, but you gotta get there first. So <clears throat> that's a good example of expectations. Staff expected me to give this presentation, she just expected me to get here. So on that note, uh, that's sort of how I view our expectations thread, is that the students 
uh, see it as for us to explain to them what, they ex what we expect out of them, but at the same time, we can use it to explain to them what they can expect out of us. So I start at the end of one term, I start prepping my class uh, for the next term, and I'll take all my expectations that I posted from the previous term. Usually I post anywhere from 30 to 40 expectation threads. It's usually what it ends up being. And uh, so I'll read through them, update them, and then post them for the next class. And uh, this helps students, uh, especially since we have the, the, the introduction week now, they can go out and pre-read some of the expectations of what's expected of them so they can start thinking about thinking down the road and planning their workload. And so I start off by introducing the course and what it means to them in their career, uh, things they can do to get started along with their introduction, like uh, getting started on the readings and previewing the rubrics and uh, the chapters that are assigned for the first two weeks, and just use it to encourage them to start strong so they can get a head start in what they're expected to do. I'll post a thread about grading, and I emphasize grading to them. Uh, particularly the top of the class expectation that's listed in the rubric uh, so that they know what's the difference between minimum workload and the exceeding workload. Uh, a lot of them, as you've, you've probably all experienced, sometimes think that just doing the minimum work is good enough. And although that might have been the case in an undergraduate class, it's not the case in a graduate class. And that's how I explain, to them, explain it to them, that we have different expectations for them as working professionals. And then I emphasize the deadlines as well. Uh, I'm pretty strict with deadlines. I do work with them when they have a legitimate uh, uh, excuse, work, family. If it's a legitimate excuse, I work with them. Otherwise, I do expect them to meet the deadlines. Uh, I also post examples of uh, A-plus discussion that I've taken from, a, from a, the previous classes. I don't use names, but I do post A work. So to give them a framework of what I consider to be an A-plus discussion, and so they can work toward that and, uh, and then continue in uh, referencing the discussions that they can uh, refer to during the term so that they, uh, if they have questions about their own work or if they have questions about uh, what is considered uh, top of the class work, that's the word I'm looking for, then they'll know. Uh, another post I make on the expectations board is APA formatting. Uh, I know that's busy work. They may consider it busy work, but it still uh, reflects professionalism, I think, when they follow appropriate APA styles. So I stress that to them, uh, particularly when it comes to the references, and also in expect them to uh, reference their visual aids. And I know it's uh, time consuming, but for those who are willing to put in the work, I think it prepares them to uh, strive for perfection. Whereas if you just skip on that sort of stuff, even though it's housekeeping sort of things, uh, it reflects in your work overall. Uh, I also emphasize posting visuals. About a third of the class sometimes likes to get by with just writing text and not putting in the extra effort to go out and find supporting materials like videos or charts or infographics or even making their own that they can use to support the points that they make in their discussions and their assignments and also embedding it properly. They seem to struggle with that. So I uh, post instructions on the uh, expectations three or two about how they can embed visuals, and that helps them out along the way. Uh, another post I'll make on the expectations board is uh, participating in all, the, all of the discussions. Uh, I use it as an opportunity to take the discussion question that's listed in the assignment and expand on what I uh, anticipate from them from that discussion question. I will hold their hand a little bit. I will go ahead some, in some cases and provide them with some uh, resources that they can check out. I provide them with examples, uh, case studies, anything that will help give them a boost along the way. And uh, they seem to appreciate that. I post follow-ups on the expectations board after an assignment is over. I will post, and going back screen, uh, I do the same thing for assignments as well as discussions too, not just the discussions. And then I post follow-ups at the end of discussions and assignments and emphasize the key points and the, and the takeaways that were made for that week uh, so that they can understand a little bit better where I was coming from with their grading if I didn't make it clear in the feedback to begin with. 
Uh, I use it to uh, post reminders, uh, encourage them to continue to uh, meet their deadlines uh, about the evaluations that we do every semester and integrate. And students seem to appreciate it. Here's a sample of some of the comments that have been made uh, in the evaluation at the end of the course. Uh, some tips I actually need to follow myself, which I plan to start doing in future courses. Instead of preloading them at the beginning of the course, I plan to space them out a little bit better so they're not overloaded. I think I sometimes make the error that Frank pointed out just a second ago, giving them too much information at one time. So I plan to spread space them out a little bit. Uh, I'm also long-winded when it comes to writing, so I need to go and divide them up a little bit, maybe get a little shorter on my uh, post. And there's still some I have in mind that I'm going to continue to add to taking their comments from evaluations and, and seeing where I could have performed perform better, I've thought of some other ideas that I can do to uh, improve the expectations board. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, Susan Jones is going to talk to us about um, providing, uh, let me see, engaging on discussion boards. Thanks, Cindy. So I love the discussion board. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, I learned so much from the students. It's stimulating. They are finding things that I haven't found. They encourage me to find things. And it's really one of the reasons why I continue to teach at the graduate level because it's so much more stimulating, frankly, than undergrad. So how to inspire a lively discussion board? I try to look approachable. I've had people tell me, I've actually gotten clients because they would say, well, we saw your picture and you looked approachable. You didn't look like you were going to be negative in any way, easy to talk to, and that's what I want to make sure the students feel like. And um, I don't use the generic type of icons. I have everything being very personal. So at the top, I have my video. I have pictures of the family. I'm a, I'm a person, I'm not just a teacher, I'm not a hard person to get to know. Talk about my husband, our pet, our parrot, our uh, grandkids. This is a picture down here of the whole family. And it's personal and inviting, which I think encourages them to share more when they introduce themselves. So uh, as we're supposed to do, of course, I greet each student in week one with a personal welcome and individual comments. And I try to make it more than just generic comments. So I'll say, oh, I used to live in such and such a place, or have you ever been to this restaurant in your hometown? As you know, we have a lot of students from Pittsburgh. I'm from Pittsburgh, as I mentioned recently. Grew up in Bethel Park. Uh, our family farm was in Washington, PA. Just little things to just make us personally connected, not just teacher and student. And so when I respond to them, of course, they all, they seem to love their dogs more than their kids a lot of times. <laughs> so, oh, what an adorable dog. What a cute cat. What breed is it? Um, tell me more about that breed, and uh, if they do something else, if they're athletic or they do craft projects, then we talk about that too. And um, when they talk about what they do in work, I try to encourage them and say, wow, your knowledge of social media or what you're doing with data, that's really going to be great. I look forward to your insights. So I try to make it from day one. It's not I'm the teacher, you're the student. We're all at the graduate level and we're going to be partners in this. I'm just the facilitator. So uh, I provide guidelines on what I'm looking for beyond the general guidelines for posts. And I really liked what Lee said. He really sets it up with lots of expectations. And I go in there and do the same thing. When we're doing posts, I'm not looking for just a, a generic five line thing. You know, I have students that think that they can be, a, and in fact, I had one last week. She posted on Sunday, and then she posted on Friday between 11.07 and 11.17. 
ha, she dropped the class <laughs> after I very politely explained to her that this was not appropriate. So I give them lots of information about what I'm looking for beyond the generic post, but I do refer them to the generic post for information. Now, I've been with the program for 11 years, so I remember when discussion boards were way less um, points, but some students are doing less than they did back then. So um, I answer every student's initial post every single week. I try to get back to everybody at least once more and interact with each student uh, as much as I can and as I think a lot of us do, use their posts to spur them to do more and to talk about more. And I also tell them if I'm gonna be off the board for a while, if I'm traveling, if I'm gonna be on a plane, so they don't think I've just disappeared. And how to put a damper on the discussion board, disappear. I mean, we really have to make, particularly Wednesday to Friday, something where we're checking quite a bit. 10 to me is really minimal particularly when I have a larger class, I can do 30, 40 posts a week. They're not, uh, you know, they're not really, really long, but I'm just making sure people know I'm there and I'm talking to them. Don't openly criticize. If something happens on a post that's not what I'm looking for, I send an email. So uh, we do have one discussion board where I have to kind of criticize them, but I say, let me give you, I always say, let me give you some suggestions. And uh, don't do things we ask students not to do, and don't condescend to students. I really try to make this facilitating rather than I'm so smart and you're just a kid, because, you know, they're not. <laughs> they are smart cookies, and I enjoy being with them a lot, and I try to make that come through. So that's it. Okay, our next presentation is providing feedback on assignments and discussions, and Mark Tebow will be presenting. Okay, and this is the right button, right? Yes. Hi. Oops, I broke it. Anyway, I'm Mark Tebow. I already told you pretty much what I teach, and uh, I really like the classroom setting. I don't know what, how, I, it's gonna be interesting to see how much I can add to what everybody else has already put, because I do a lot of the same thing. But anyway, this for me is the key. You know, Michelangelo, this is a tribute to him. I don't know if it's alleged or real, but the, notice the age when he said that, 87. Well, I hope at 87, I'm still learning. And uh, I mean, I think this is a great age that we live in for learning. And uh, so anyway, so I'm looking forward to it. Oh, backward. I think lifelong learning is a must. We need to teach this to our students. This is my contribution to this discussion. Um, facts are certainly important, but in my field, I don't know about all your fields, facts change constantly, all the time. I can literally set up a class teach the class, and while I'm teaching the class, a lot of the facts will change. So the key for me is that I want them to learn how to learn. I want them to support what they tell me. I don't want them to necessarily memorize facts. Facts are good, but I mean, the world as we know it, Google, Facebook, machine learning, artificial intelligence, semantic search, all these things constantly are changing and without really any advance warning. So, you know, the, the problem that I run into is twofold. One, there's a lot that's published. In fact, I was just reading an article the other day. It was written in Europe. And what they were saying is the scientific community in Europe is just so inundated with published material they can't even keep up in their own field. I think we can all appreciate that, certainly here in uh, what we do. I mean, it changes a lot. The other hand is a lot becomes obsolete. I don't know if you guys suffer from this, but I see it all the time. 
and, and again, I need to teach them how to, how to think about this because if you're quoting something from 2012, in my field, it's probably not accurate anymore. Now, that said, I will point out that a lot of the seminal thinking in our field was probably written probably in 2010, 2012. And so I have to, one of the things I do encourage students on is to learn how to know what's real and what is not real. I stress very strongly that if you find a source, verify it. Don't just stop with one source. You need to verify it and move on to another source. Make sure that what you're saying is real. And part of the problem I run into is one of the real prophets and messiahs in analytics writes a daily blog and weekly blog, and I encourage them to participate and subscribe to that. But the textbook that he wrote hasn't been updated since 2010. Now, I use pieces of that because his thinking is masterful. I mean, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. But, of course, a lot of the programs and platforms and everything that existed in 2010 are no longer there. So, so starting the class out with the right expectations, and here this is very similar to what a lot of the rest of you said, I start out and I give them a lot to begin with. Again, they have the first week, so I, I tell them exactly what they can expect from me, what I will do, so I will respond promptly. Generally, I'll respond within a couple hours. Um, everything, on the, everything in the email comes to my phone. So if I can't give them an answer right away, I will tell them when they can expect an answer. I mean, I, I consider that to be very, very, I, ha I also have a heavy class participation. Probably not as heavy as Susan's, but I, I tend to do it a little differently, you know, and, uh, but I also have expectations from them. You know, I expect graduate qu quality level work, especially on the thinking side. I expect on time submissions. I expect being active on the discussion board. If you're not those things, we're not probably going to get along real well. Um, but I, I do greet every class before they come to the class once I know who the students are. And like Susan Lee, I answer every introductory post. So what do I do? I think I'm sort of like you, Lee, in this way. I push back. And I do it politely, but I push back. I don't, wanna, I don't want you to tell me that this is what I believe is true. Not unless you've also substantiated that with one or two or three multiple sources and you've synthesized. To me, synthesizing what you learn is incredibly, incredibly important. And in my comments and in my points on the discussion board, I, I always ask why. I ask a lot of why questions. And frequently I'll ask two or three whys. And, and to me, that is really what's important because what I do is I tend to participate, I probably write 15, 25, 30 posts every week, but I don't do it, I don't hit everybody in the same week. Everybody gets hit four or five times in the discussion board, but I don't hit everybody every week. But what I will do is I will hammer two or three or four, you know, things to keep a certain level of conversation going. And the conversations tend to be pretty, uh, pretty unique. I will say that. Um, one of the things we do, and one of the things I find is most educating for the students, is that we tend to get off on a lot of tangents. We, uh, we, fought, we also pursue a lot of things. Being in web analytics, SEO, mobile marketing, we can go a lot of different places. So we'll end up talking about uh, AI or agile marketing, or perhaps we'll end up talking about technology or, you know, one of my favorites is customer experience. That always seems to come up in both classes. You know, how do I measure customer experience? That's, but that's really more of a topic that we will get into on Saturday. And I actually look forward to that. Sometimes we'll drill deep. I mean, I don't intend to do that, but like sometimes some of the students, 
because one of the things I get in 642 is a wide range. I get some novices and I get some very experienced people. And so they'll want to, so they'll, they'll very much want to get into, um, you know, the depth of let's do, let's talk about UTM or let's talk about Google Tag Manager. And we can do that in the discussion posts and some people will participate and some people won't. Um, so anyway, what I do real quickly to sum up is I give a lot of feedback on their assignments. I download the assignments. I probably put eight, 10, 12 or more comments on their assignments directly on the assignments, pre-upload them. I also tend to write two, three, four paragraphs for each assignment. Of course, it depends on how good it is and um, also some general conditions. I also do that on the discussions. I'll add two or three paragraphs that are very specific to what they wrote on the discussion board that week. And lastly, um, and Matt, Matthew taught me this one. So one of the things I do at the bottom there is I provide every week some perspective on what's coming up. I look at perspective on what we're going to talk about on the discussion board, what their upcoming assignment is all about, and I also recap the week. What went right, what went wrong, what I liked, what never came up. And there we are. When Leo introduced himself, he said, if we can't pronounce his name, that's okay. So I'm not even going to butcher it. Um, but Leo will be talking about utilizing audio feedback. Yeah, we're about to say my last name, so it's fine. I even practiced. We still can't. I actually have a YouTube video. I watched your yeah. YouTube video, but I still can't get it. So. <laughs> no worries, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Can everyone hear me okay? All righty. I get really excited, sorry. So I recently just started teaching. As you heard at the beginning, it was my first semester. There you can see me. There's my little pug. I have a laser, just in case you get confused who's who. I was really, really excited. I couldn't wait. I could teach from anywhere. I travel a lot. So I could connect with students everywhere. Like, this is one of the best times to ever be alive. Like, I wish I was a student now, being able to do this, being able to connect with all y'all being able to connect with other people around the world. It, I, it just was crazy excited. All right, I jumped right into the discussions. I was so excited, I couldn't wait. I had office hours. I was like, yes, let's do it, call me, let's get on Zoom, let's do whatever we need to do. I made videos, as you saw, here's one I did. Hey everyone, my name is Leo Morejon. If you can't pronounce my last name, it's a recurring it trend. perfectly fine, but again, that's Morejon, just in case you wanna venture out and try. I am super, super excited to be part of this journey with you here at WVU. I am- Yeah, enough of that, but you get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I made videos, I was in discussion boards, but when it came to grading papers, I really just it felt cold, it felt inefficient. I just didn't feel like I was building affinity, I wasn't really working with folks. I just, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel that connection that I felt in the discussion boards on the cause, so on and so on. So I was sad. <laughs> I wanted to connect with students, all right? And feedback needed to be memorable, all right? I needed to make sure that I was memorable. So you can remember this now, right? You're, I'm totally cracking up. You're hysterical. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I tried to incorporate that as well. Like, I wanted my feedback to be memorable. I didn't want to just type something out real quick and be like, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. Like, I thought I was boring. They're not going to remember it. All right, so I was sitting at my desk one day. I was just there with my pug, Truth. And I noticed my podcast equipment. Did you miss it? I mean, how did I miss it? It's like right there in front of me this whole time. <laughs> right, so I started using my podcast technology to teach. Actually, you saw the video I created. There was a background, and in fact, actually, the background that you saw before, too, 
That's literally a poster of wood. It's not real wood behind me or anything. So I have a podcast, it's called Build and Inspire, and it's fo focused on exactly doing this, building people up, inspiring people to do things, do amazing things. So and these are the avocados that I grew up eating and that I still eat. And these are the ones that are coming from the tree. Jesus. Look at my head for scale. I yeah. Head, but. It's about business, I promise, not about avocados. Uh, so I thought, why not use this? Why not actually start using all this? And I started doing it, and it started working out. I started providing grades to people based on audio feedback. I wasn't always yelling. Most of the time, I probably just sounded like this, but with my pug running around a little. Then why, though? Like, why is audio important? Why should you use audio? Why did it work? Why did I use it? Audio is powerful, right? So audio is actually older than writing or reading. I need to get into that. The most important thing, actually, that's really important as to why I have a podcast, why I, sh I share my information and feedback on audio, is because audio is passive. You could be doing anything else while still listening. That includes driving, cooking, running, or whatever the heck this is. All right? So wherever the students are, they could go ahead and actually start understanding and really listening wherever they need to and re-listen to it. The most important thing is, though, it provides subtext. We've all been in those situations where someone texts you, write you an email, and like, that guy's being a jerk. But they weren't, right? They are probably be like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? Let's hang out. And you're like, wow. All right, way to be aggressive. But at the end of the day, they could hear my tone. They could hear my emotion. They could hear really what I felt behind the emotion, which is almost impossible to do in text, maybe with emojis here and there, but not really. And we're in the golden age of audio. We have podcasts, right? More than 50% of all homes are podcast fans. It's growing. Voice assistants. There are people nowadays, there are kids actually that talk to inanimate objects that they think could talk back to them. There was a survey that came out saying that people actually consider some of these their best friends. They need lives, but at the end of the day, they still consider them friends. And it's growing. So voice is all around us. It's all around our students. They appreciate it, they look for it, they enjoy it. So takeaways. It was efficient. So students could listen while they were reviewing the paper. So they could actually hear me say something and go in the paper and hear me continue to talk about the paper as they were scrolling versus having text on the side and then the paper on the other side and having to look at both, right? They could do both simultaneously, again, because it's passive. And also, I realized that I ended up grading faster. So I could actually just get up on my mic and say, you know, I like this, I like that, X, Y, Z, you should do this, you should focus on that. And I'd be able to turn them out like that compared to actually typing things out. Also, equipment. You should strive for the best. The great thing is it's really not that expensive. So I'll share this deck too and I'll share everything that I use. So at the end of the day, I use a free recording app. You can download it from the App Store. There's a Windows version as well. This is a mic stand that I use. It's only $13. This is the filter that I use, a pop filter, so when I go you don't hear that kind of stuff, all right? And at the end of the day, that was, like I said, almost $13. The most expensive is the mic. I really do suggest that you invest in this. Again, I wanted to be able to provide quality. I wanted it to be clear. I didn't want it to popping sounds when they were listening on their headphones and stuff like that. But most importantly, it connected with students, right? They could hear my emotion, they could hear my tone, and at the end of the day, they remembered what I had to say. They didn't laugh as hard as you did, but maybe, maybe they did, I don't know. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I got questions, cool. I uploaded it right there where you type in the notes. No? Yeah, there were, there were short files, so it wasn't high quality, like crazy high quality. Maybe the most was like a megabyte. Mm -hmm. excuse me, a broadcast. So my students are always out in the field and I have to teach them how to say things. Sure. Right? And so I will do like your voice memo and then just like upload it through an email or a text. Yeah. So even when I think when people are looking at that thinking a hundred bucks for a mic, I mean you don't even need that. It's not about you don't. quality yeah. what you're saying. That's true too. So I never even thought about the idea that you could do that for online as well. Yeah. I do that now in the classroom. Hundred percent. Because they often need to hear inflection as You got it, that's subtext. 
Awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. And actually, that's growing now, too. So some of the younger friends that I have, actually, instead of texting me, they'll just write notes. Hey, Leo, you wanna meet up here? Hey, do you wanna do lunch? And that's how we, it's basically like a walkie-talkie. Sorry, Lee. You could actually use your cell phone, too. You could, yeah, I used to use my cell phone, too. Actually, my first podcast was just using my cell phone in a program called Anchor. I read the paper first, then I go back. Yeah, and sometimes I'll, even, you know, I want it to be clear, and I'll make a mistake, or literally my dog will run around or something, and I'll redo it. So I try, I do strive for quality, so when they're listening to it, they're not being distracted or anything. Have you found that a length is too long or too short based on their feedback? Uh, not on their feedback, actually, but I've tried to keep it based on like 30 to 60 seconds, and just trying to get all the main points in there. Does that answer your question? Got it, yeah. I would do it as well, especially if I forgot something. Like sometimes I would record something that was 60 seconds. I'm like, is it worth me actually going back and re-recording this whole thing? Or if I felt that it could be complimentary or supplementary to what I had to say, then certainly. But most of the time it was if I forgot something. Any other questions? Interesting. I've not. I have them. I have them on my in, on my desktop, but I've not actually gone back and listened to them. I love that idea, and I will do that. Anything else? No. Do you want to see pictures of my pug again? Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you so much. going to talk to us about incorporating VoiceThread. Well, and first I'd like to give a shout out to my good friend Craig Davis from Ohio University. Chad and I actually went there to visit, and it was actually Craig that introduced us to VoiceThread, and then we learned more to know how we could turn it on here at WVU, and I've been testing it the last academic year. And then also in line with Susan, when she said to be personable, I'm going to give you fair warning. You're about to see a video and a couple of slides of me responding to a student with no makeup wearing a WVU hoodie. So just be prepared. So what is VoiceThread? VoiceThread is a tool that enables audio, text, and video comments. You can actually pick which of those you'd like to use. You can record and share your comments with your classes, and then you can, uh, the students can comment to yours, they can comment to one another, or as an instructor, I can privately comment to the student. Now I want to clarify, this is not an instant messenger type of tool where the students can one-on-one -on -one privately communicate to one another. I only have that option as the instructor. Now there is a graded component, I discovered that this past semester, that actually made life a whole lot easier. And I do want to remind you, this is not live or web video conferencing. This is not Collaborate Ultra. Bill Nevin is going to be talking about that next. This is actually something where I can post a comment, the students can watch it on their time, they can comment back on their time, and we can keep the conversation going there too. So I think it really works well in our current model, especially in the discussion, since we have that asynchronous model where students can log in when they need. On the right here, I've put a photo of what the dashboard looks like. And it's a real easy to use feature where you can choose whether you want text comments, the audio, text, uh, the audio comments, or the webcam, or you can save different compatible files and upload those from your computer too. So lots of options there. So VoiceThread in the classroom. Again, I've been using VoiceThread the last academic year. I've been using that in uh, my two large classes that I teach on ground that also have a high, really heavy online component, as well as my, uh, as well as my writing class as well. So I want to kind of get you started here. It's playing. Showing you just an example of how I used it in one of my classes to pitch their idea for a final project. So for the final project, I would like to work with the Boy Scouts of America. I've actually done a lot of work with them in the past. 
Um, and one of the reasons why I want to work with them right now for the final project is because they've been going through a lot of different changes here recently, and a lot of them have been fairly controversial, so they can use all of the public relations help they can get, especially because most of the program that they provide is actually ran by volunteers. So any help that they can get for public relations help or promotions help, they're more than happy to, um, to, to have. Now, for this particular student, you notice that I used the text response. I didn't do an audio or a video. In this particular class, I was trying to test, and it just kind of popped up with my response to him. So how exactly does it work as far as a management uh, to grade discussions, to grade uh, what I might use? This is another screenshot from one of my classes. And if you notice, right there in the middle is that sort of oval dashboard where everything comes to life. Now, I want to remind you, this plays well with eCampus. This actually works well right inside of eCampus. You do not need to go to another tool or do something to pull it in. It, so eCampus frame is all around this. I just cropped it out so you could see better. So this is another example of a student that I, that I had used in my class. On the right is the roster of my class. And you can see where I assigned a grade for their participation. One thing that you can't change is you actually have to enter grades as a percentage scale. So those of us that are so used to entering points, you actually have to enter a 95% or a 100%. I haven't been able to figure out a change to that. But the really neat thing about doing this is the remind feature. So it builds in and it knows which student has posted a voice thread and which student hasn't. And even prior to the deadline, with one button, I can click and basically remind those students who have not yet posted that the deadline's coming up and they need to take advantage of this. Now, the great thing about this, it is a customized message that pops up that will go to everyone. It sure beats, I teach large classes, so in the class of 100, 17 might not do it by the deadline. So rather than sending 17 emails, I can send one. And I can customize that message, but it reaches everyone at one time. So some other tips about how it works. I want to show you one more example from my class that shows a student posting and me responding to that with the video. So this screenshot on the left shows a little bit of what you see when you mouse over, when you hover over something voice thread me campus. It's going to show you the author the title of their post, that's going to become important because just like a discussion board, we can have multiple forums. So you can have multiple topics going at the same time, so you want to make sure this is categorized where it needs to be. Also, you can see how many times was this voice thread viewed. You can also get some metrics on how many comments were left, and those comments are any type of comments, not just text, video, or audio. And it has a subscribe feature. So as we talked about earlier, every single one of us in this room should be subscribed to the faculty dashboard, and we know how that works. We get an email alerting us that something's been posted. So actually, VoiceThread works very similarly in the same way. So here's an example to kind of show in one of my large classes. This particular girl, she was very quiet. She was very shy. She didn't like to speak in class. And I had each student, though, post what they wanted to do for a special topic project paper. And I was able to use each one to provide feedback. And that was sort of eliminating having to meet with each of the students one on one. And then, of course, anyone in the class could watch and see this as well. It is playing. Hi everyone, so for my special topics project, I was hoping to do something along the lines of looking at jingles throughout music and seeing kind of how if there's a correlation between maybe genre of music and an advertisement um, to see, you know, what is more effective on the viewers and memorizing the product because I think music definitely has um, a big impact on advertisements and people remember the music and words about the product can be, you know, put in the music. So I was going to see if there's any sort of special correlations between genres, maybe keys, um, if music works at all. So that would be um, something along the lines of what I would like to do my project about. And then here is my response I made to her, the class could see. Hi Gabby, thanks for using VoiceThread. So I'm excited to see that you found a way to bridge the gap between your own interest in your performing arts and the music industry as a whole as it relates to our course. So you're gonna easily find a lot of data and studies and statistics in the role of music. I particularly like how you wanna maybe explore this correlation in genre of music and how that creates the tone and the expectation for a brand and culture and society. So I'm excited for this, good luck. 
So I actually didn't require students to watch everyone else's voice thread. But I found when I wasn't dressed like I was teaching, when I was at home in a hoodie and I looked approachable, even though it might be 6.30 in the morning, they could watch it at 11.30 at night, they were more likely to watch it. And I actually found they would watch one another's feedback and the comment that I provided to other students. So I thought it was pretty good there. So overall thoughts as I wrap up and conclude, overall I think it's an excellent tool and it plays extremely well with eCampus already. It's easy to use, it's easy to get started, it's pretty intuitive. I think it really adds to that sense of engagement and interactivity and really creating that sense of community between ourselves and our students as well. I think we've probably all seen the articles lately, the effectiveness of video, especially now on memorability and learning. So we're really bringing that video component to our traditional classes too. The only negative I've encountered is a little bit of a lag between the audio and the video. It's never been an audio problem, but if you pay attention as you're watching the videos, you notice the lips don't always match up quite. But again, I don't think that's enough of a problem to not see the benefit. So next steps, I'm going to actually in the fall start recording mini lecture highlights using VoiceThread. You can actually upload some different files and annotate those files and record those as well. And then next week, I'm beginning a two-week online certification program to become a VoiceThread certified educator. And I'm hoping at the end of that, I'm planning to work with Cindy and perhaps in the fall offer a professional development a luncheon, a webinar, to share my results and how that might be useful to our online programs. So thank you. Okay, Bill Nevin's going to share information on using Collaborate Ultra. Hi, everybody. Uh, I teach IMC 610. Uh, I've been teaching it for about 12 years, and this is the first course that students are, are required to take. And uh, there's been a lot of talk this afternoon about how can we engage our students more? Obviously, with it being online, we have challenges with that. So there's a tool that's readily available called Collaborate Ultra. How many of you have used Collaborate Ultra? Okay, good many of you. So maybe what I'm going to talk about here, you've already experienced and, and have stories to share of your success. You might remember before Collaborate Ultra, there was Collaborate. How many of you used Collaborate? A few of you. It was kind of, I felt it was a little clunky. You had to get in and out of it. You had to reserve uh, time. It, it, was, it was a little bit difficult to use. Collaborate Ultra is um, much easier. It's much more intuitive. Uh, what is it? It's essentially just like an online classroom. Uh, you have uh, real-time video conferencing. Uh, you, it lets you uh, share apps, uh, PowerPoints. Uh, you can have a guest speaker. Uh, there's a whiteboard that you can interact with students. And it also, as I mentioned, you, know, you can just open it right there in your browser. It's listed right along the left-hand side of your homepage. This is what it looks like when you first click on the, uh, the classroom. It's, it's just an, an, an open classroom like this. There are two particular areas to pay attention to. One is in the bottom right-hand corner where you see that little pink, and then there's another similar one up in the upper left-hand side. When you click on the bottom pink button there, that will pop open, which gives you the opportunity at the bottom uh, to chat. You can also post content. There's uh, an area where you set for your audio and your, your visual. Um, it's um, right down in the, in the middle there underneath also has where you can mute your microphone. You can also uh, mute your video uh, camera as well. 
When you click on the share content button down at the bottom, this will pop up. And so you can insert different things. You can put in, uh, for example, like a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, what, what I really like about this too is that it has the ability for students to, uh, to call in if they're on the road and they just don't have access to a particular um, uh, computer at the time, you can still get the audio feed. How I use Collaborate Ultra, and I'm relatively new to it, but I have used it uh, as a way to engage students beyond just being available to them for office hours. Uh, I usually make an announcement early on in my class that I'm going to be holding online office hours the third, fifth, and seventh weeks of the course. Those are really where we get into a lot of material and they might have questions. And so I typically have uh, a half hour sessions during those particular weeks and I vary them at the times of the evening. Just some people might not be available on Thursday night at eight o'clock every particular week. And then it lets students, uh, I let them know early and often, and I also remind them that particular week that we have online office hours if you have any questions. And I've had some really good success with it. I had a student uh, during my class in the spring who was actually traveling on the road, had, knew that I was having uh, classroom hours, online classroom hours, office hours, and he wrote down the phone number and called me on his way to Nashville with a couple of questions about a project that week. So I got a phone call that came right in. He didn't have, obviously, a, a video camera available, but I was able to take his call and answered questions. I had a student from California hook up on video, uh, had a great conversation with her, talking about the particular assignment for that week. She had a few questions. I try to make my students aware that I'm always available to answer questions pretty much 24 seven during that eight week period. I, even on weekends, I'm, you know, questions come into my cell phone, I, I answer them. But this is another way just to engage students again, to let them know, hey, I'm available. If you have any questions, this is an opportunity. And again, as I mentioned, there's so many ways that you can use this. Guest speaker, you can have uh, a lecture that you wanna do on a particular topic. You can have a PowerPoint presentation many different uh, ways that people can use this. And I'll be interested to talk to some of the other instructors here about how they've used Collaborate Ultra. But it's again, it's a great, easy way to engage your students beyond just uh, the discussion board. Any questions? David? That's a great question. Uh, the times that I've had people in, engage with me, it's typically just been one student. Rick, you might not have an answer to this, but I think multiple students can, can hook up at the same time. So you might have a couple of people there on video Yes, David. Uh, you mentioned outside speakers, but the outside speakers really have to be within the Blackboard system, right? They can't. So. I've never had an, uh, uh, an outside speaker. How would that work, Rick? Do you know? Yeah, you go up to the word the external link, and then the browser or the hotspot on the computer will find the server and then you can go in. I just knew that was available, but that's a good question. Yes, uh, in fact, that button that's up in the left, if you click on that, there's an operator right at the top, it says record the session. And then right underneath it, that's like the audio number. And there's some other things right there that are available. It's available, I think, when you do that too, right? Yes. Any other questions? Thank you.
Kate Nicole Beeson's going to share how she integrates um, student instructor calls into her class. Hi, how are you? Um, so just wanted to say that um, this was the first time that I had um, incorporated this into my class. So um, test one. Um, but uh, it was really something that I enjoyed. Um, and I really felt that it was a, an, an engaging experience for sure. So I did this in my PR 438 event execution course this past spring. I had 20 students, um, 14 seniors and six juniors. Um, as you can see, I had a variety of majors. Uh, there were about eight um, Stratcom majors and then other majors across the entire campus. Um, so a lot of them, while having an event planning minor and a variety of other minors, um, may have not had any previous experiences um, with um, event courses or um, other online courses as well. Um, so I think that was one of the things that I wanted to kind of gauge an individual conversation with these students um, to kind of make sure that they had the, the best experience as possible. Um, so with the one-on-one -on -one calls, um, this was something that uh, one of my IMC professors, um, IMC 618, Tina McCorkendale, um, put into place for our um, final project. Um, it was a culmination course similar to um, the event execution course that I teach. So every assignment built on each other and making sure that all of those um, received individual feedback as you went through to make sure the final project um, was the most positive, was really the direction um, that I was hoping to go. Um, also, I talked with my um, intern and I asked her, I said, you know, what do you feel is the most beneficial for undergraduate students? Are they wanting to sit in a, an open office hours or would they rather have individual feedback? Um, and then based on the type of course that I was teaching, she said, you know, I really think that they'll take the time to do um, individual feedback. Um, so the timeline for this, I set this up after assignment four. So the majority of their um, assignments have received um, feedback. Um, I said the, um, I started that, that week and then it ended the, um, uh, for the undergrad courses, they're 12 weeks as you guys know, unless they're in summer then they're six and I think I'll definitely modify this as we move forward. Um, but I gave them kind of about a two week time frame to set up calls. Um, with me. I was very flexible with my schedule uh, to accommodate their schedule. Um, I did some calls at 7 o'clock in the morning. I did some calls at 6 o'clock at night. Um, I really wanted it to be something that was going to work um, for them um, so we could have this, that conversation. Um, participation. So I had 18 out of 20 students participate. Um, the 19th one was like on the fence. She scheduled two calls and then it didn't go through, but I feel like 18 out of 20, I was pretty happy with that um, for the first go round. Um, it was 10 to 30 minutes um, in length on average, um, with most of them being about 15 minutes. We reviewed um, feedback from each assignment. They, we started with questions that they had for me and we went through um, everything from those assignments and then the final project. Um, we also discussed future plans and career outlook. It really just, for the seniors, that was more pressing and I was happy to kind of walk them through, you know, next steps, whether that was internships, jobs, networks, whatever that looks like. Um, benefits, ESEI, and recommendations. So overall quality of final project um, was much better than I had had in previous semesters um, by taking that one-on-one -on -one feedback with each individual student. Um, I also received positive feedback on my ESCIs. They mentioned the calls, they mentioned the engagement, they were very happy with that experience. Um, future courses, I will definitely um, do probably two calls. I'd like to, um, and especially with VoiceThread, I want to know more about that. I think that was awesome. Uh, I definitely want to have that engaging experience right away. Um, I think that they, if they know you're vested um, and want to take the extra time, then they'll take the extra time as well. Um, and then also open to FaceTime or Skype, VoiceThread, whatever that looks like, um, and even Leo with video. I think that will be a lot of fun. Questions? Yes. What vehicle did you use to write the call? Did you use the discussion board, email, or announcements, or what was that? So a combination of the two. Um, I definitely did email, and then I did um, 
a discussion board. And I would say that at first I probably had 12 of them sign up out of the, the 20, and then with additional follow-ups. Ultimately, I really wanted them to do this to get the best feedback. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, we're running just a little ahead of schedule. Cindy Greenglass is gonna share with us um, information about being a program ambassador. Mm, am I, so am I like the last thing between you and the bar? That's always a bad place to be on the agenda. Oh, goody. <laughs> um, you know, we've had so many people give such great input in it, and, and the conversation we had before the break about all the things we could do to promote the program that I don't feel that I really um, have much additional that I can add, but um, I know that when Chad and Cindy reached out and said, why don't you spend some time talking about how um, we worked collaboratively to bring the DMC program together. And I said, okay, well, I'll be happy to do so. Um, a little bit about how it all began. So um, like Mark said, I, I think we all are all um, perpetual learners. And being a practitioner and not an educator, I came around um, to doing the IMC program because I wanted to learn, and I wanted to learn and bring that learning into everything that I did as a practitioner, and I also was fascinated by the academic world and the academic community. You know, academics have an aura around you, and as, you know, I think it's kind of cool for me to be able to say that I'm an adjunct or an instructor, and for those of us that are practitioners, it brings a level of um, credibility that people um, in the business world really strive for. So I went to get an IMC degree because it brought credibility and academic level of uh, credibility to me in where I was in my career. So when I started looking at the courses and I started thinking, everything I was doing was looking at, well, how could I learn more? When you look at all the students in your class, the students in your class are like us practitioners. They want to learn more. So you can put yourself in the same shoes as your students to say as practitioners, what is it that they wanna learn? And how can we bring and um, the enthusiasm and the knowledge that we have in the classroom to them as practitioners? And that's kinda how it all started. So I took the IMC class and what did I see? Um, I'm an analyst, I'm a data geek basically. That's I love data and my whole thing is I like to find stories and data. And I look for what's missing. And what I was saying is there's like this missing gap in IMC and the missing gap is we have a lot of really great people who came up through marketing, who stayed away from math, who were terrified of it, who didn't take classes in it, who may not see themselves necessarily as um, analytic thinkers, they see themselves more as creative thinkers. And there's, you know, data can be really, really creative too. But um, I realize that I kept sit, going through these discussion posts and I'd be the only person on the discussion board in my class, literally in every class, who would bring an analytical point of view to a discussion. And I would hear over and over again, you bring this really different perspective we'd never heard. And then I got into Mark's class and I was like, oh my God, somebody who teaches analytics. So I, you, I don't know, it came naturally to me to say in feedback back to WVU, we really passionately need to bring data and analytics into this um, program because I can't possibly be the only person out there who thinks like an analyst. And if I am, then our program is suffering. There's so much we have to do around math and data. So I shared that with the university and said, you know, I, I can't possibly be doing anything different than other people are. But I think that what was different is when you all leave here, 
we had great ideas in this room. What are you doing about those great ideas? Like lean in and put your back into it with the institution to help make it happen. So I said, what can I do to help you make this happen? So when um, the institution said, we're gonna go out to Madison Avenue, we're gonna talk to people, practitioners, how do you and your own networks have people we should all be talking to? We have remarkable networks. We have people that we can introduce into this group of people, our, our own institution, to say how do we make it better and who should they talk to. So um, offer to do some heavy lifting. Um, and it all started because I don't trust people's opinions. I said if it's not fact, it it's, means nothing to me. So that brought and informed my passion to kind of help everybody. Um, so what does it take? I looked at this and said, what do I do? I listen to podcasts every day. I stream them on my way to work because I spend four hours in my car every day going back and forth. So how, what did I do? I said, hey, I do podcasts. We have tremendous knowledge and content across WVU. Why aren't we doing a podcast? Just ask the question, what about why not the podcast? And look what, you know, not just why not. What's the next thing that you can do? So I said to myself, if I was having a dinner party, who do I want to have at my dinner table? Now, if you asked each one of you, what are the five people you would invite to sit at the dinner table with you? Think of the cool guests we could have on our podcast. That's literally how I approach things. Who do I want to learn from? If I wanted to have somebody to learn from, who do I want to learn from? That's who I want on my faculty. If there's somebody I heard at a conference, if there's somebody I think is really smart and interesting, I want them to be part of our faculty. Let's go get them. Let's go recruit them for our faculty. And who do I want at my dinner table? Who do I want to have a drink with? That's who I want on my podcast. So if we all just did that, think of how cool and wonderful our you know, programs can continue to be. I don't think this is anything different than we all already do. Um, I also um, try and think about every day, because again, as an analyst, when I say, um, I look for, what's my superpower? I say, my superpower is I can tell stories and data. I said, I can be a gourmet chef in anybody's kitchen. Now, I think that's a skill. You just put me in your data, and I'm gonna come out and make you an amazing meal. And I think that that's a skill I have. Each one of us has a skill that we can bring that marshals us to be greater. And if we can use that passion, think about how we can advocate for our programs even better. So I'm reading the USA Today this morning. Here's an example. I'm reading the USA Today on the airplane from Pittsburgh trying to come here. And what do I read? I read this article about, it was actually the editorial, about how this fellow doesn't want his daughter to take the SATs. He wants her to take the ACT. Did anyone read this? I don't know on, on the USA Today. Um, because the, the SATs are now going to bring in geodemographic data and they're going to use it along with test scores as part of the decision-making process using whether people come from um, neighborhoods that are more impoverished that, uh, and all sorts of other geodemographic and lifestyle data going in. He was very against it. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking this is very curious and interesting. I'm going to go back and look it up. But where did my head go? My head went, we don't teach enough about this in our classes. I'm thinking about DMC. What are we not teaching? We're not teaching privacy. We're not teaching about the negative impacts. Like there's not a, how do we start bringing in some of this into your teaching every day? How can the program get better and smarter by identifying the gaps in what we do? We often are really good about saying what we do well. What are we not doing well? And that's where I automatically went, like maybe you know, kind of say when I read that article, to say we should be figuring out how to have this conversation in my class. That's gonna go into a discussion. That might be something that we should be looking at as a future program enhancement. Where are we going with the um, good use of data and et cetera. So that kind of gives you a little thought about where I'm headed. So. Um, I think um, this is a great group of people. I've been really uh, blessed by having many of you as my instructors when I went through um, IMC. So um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to just tell you how I'm passionate about it and what I do to try and support the program. That's it. Cocktails? No. <laughs> In a few. 
Well, let's give the presenters a round of applause again. Thank you for taking the time to prepare your presentations. Okay, it is time to transition to the Hilton Garden Inn. Did anyone ride the shuttle bus over? Okay, so I guess the shuttle won't be out there then. <laughs> Does anyone need directions to Hilton Garden Inn? Boy, what a great group. Okay, we're going to transition, go to first floor, find your cars, and the integrate mixer begins at 6 o'clock at the Hilton Garden. <laughs>